That Vice Chair of Finance Delegate John Hardy is now with us. John, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, yeah, I just finished up our morning caucus and was able to get out so I could come up here and give you guys a call, and we could talk about this exciting new House Bill 2526. And this is the personal income tax, 50% cut, phased in over three years, John, 30%, 10%, 10%? It is, yes. This is the governor's bill. This is the bill that the governor spoke about on the State of the State Address. Uh, uh, the House had introduced a bill, uh, I believe that bill was 2001 or 2010, um, which was the uh, the original 10% cut that we had talked about, and we actually just uh, folded that bill into this bill. This is the governor's bill. Uh, we took that bill up in uh, House Finance. Uh, there was a committee substitute because the committee substitute is the uh, House Finance Committee and the um, uh, the chairman and myself and also the majority leader felt that we needed to put the $700 million safety net in there. So that was the committee substitute where we had uh, put the, the uh, safety net in the, in the bill uh, that will act as a, uh, um, a way that we already have a fund established. So it's a personal income tax reserve fund. So we're going to put that $700 million in there to give us a safety net. Now, that $700 million is something that's been promoted and endorsed by David Hardy. Is that correct? It is, and what this is, so we, we run our, so we've been working with revenue, we've been working with our budget office, and we've also been working with revenue um, uh, and having hearings and having meetings with them, and our projected revenue for the 2024 uh, budget year is one point, our excess revenue is $1.8 billion, so we thought we'd go ahead and pull $700 million of that excess revenue, uh, pull that in and put it, that'll, that will be in the bill and in the budget um, as our um safety net in case you know something happens uh, something catastrophic with the economy but we are projecting um 1.8 billion dollar surpluses for the next three years uh due to the the uh, uh, global uh, energy prices that are going on right now uh the growing cost of uh, what we're receiving for our met coal what we're receiving for our steam coal and more importantly uh west virginia natural gas is really coming online uh some of our pipelines are starting to be opened up and moving towards some cracker plants uh, that are in that are in Pennsylvania, so we're expecting that uh, severance taxes for our natural gas to continue to grow. Also, you mentioned cracker plants, uh, uh, John. Uh, there, four, five, six years ago, there was a great deal of optimism we'd get one of those cracker plants in West Virginia. I gather that never materialized. Is that correct? No, those cracker plants, Bill, are very, very, very expensive to build. It usually takes a, a huge uh, operation, someone like maybe Shell or or BP or someone like that to build those those stations and and uh, obviously Pennsylvania and Ohio was able to to offer a better deal than what we could here in Ohio but doesn't mean that we're not going to reap the benefits from it we are able to move uh, a lot of our Marcellus gas uh, to those plants and, and and which really drives up the price of that gas because for people out there that don't understand what a cracker plant is a cracker plant is like taking a uh, a, a big oak tree in the woods it's worth, not really worth a lot of money but if you take that beautiful oak tree and turn it into some beautiful furniture now it has gained value and the same thing happens with natural gas as we move that gas to our cracker plants we start to break that gas down into more usable parts that can be sold on the secondary market yeah. the uh, uh the success you had with uh with 2526 getting it from the house and you're giving it to the, uh will pass it to the senate do you anticipate the senate to uh to embrace this or they or we, we talked before you came on air that the senate still would like to have some form of personal property tax uh, uh cut as well uh how do you think the senate's going to accept uh, 2526 uh, you know, Bill, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what the Senate's thinking is. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that they're 100% bought in like the House is, but I can only work on what the, my caucus gives me, and I work very closely in, in the House finance, and I work very closely with my caucus, and I can tell you, uh, you know, we're building consensus in our caucus for this, and, and we're, you know, we're excited about it. Um, we are uh, pretty positive we're going to pass it out of the House on Wednesday. Uh, there may be some uh, amendments that are brought to it tomorrow on second reading, but I can only speak for the House and the House caucus to say that, you know, we're excited to be a part of this process and we're excited to uh, be moving this legislation forward. And this is a, you know, a tax cut for all West Virginians, all working West Virginians across the board. If you, if you take a look at the brackets, we've just basically taken and left the brackets they were the way they were, but with the, the first year is a 30% cut and then the second year 
as a t- another 10%, which makes it a 40% cut. And then the third year is another 10% cut, which just cuts the rates by 50%. So by the time you get to the third year, your top rate payer will be paying 3.25%, which is 50% of what the rate is right now. And those percentages apply equally down the line, John? They do. So I can run through some of these rates with you. So I'm going to – there's two different uh, taxable rates. Uh, one is for married and one is for married filing single uh, or se- uh, filing separate. So I'm going to use the, the one that most of us use. It's just, you know, the regular rate. So on the first 30 percent, which will cost the state about $800 million, um, the lowest rate would be 2.1 um, percent, and that would be for uh, any, anything that's not over $10,000 and the top rate would be 4.55%. That's anything over $60,000. And then if you move into once you the second year when the 10% kicks in, you have now moved that rate has went to 1.8% and the top rate is now at 3.9%. And then when we're fully funded at the third year um, for this bill, not saying that we're not going to continue to move forward, uh, you have cut everything in half and your bottom rate is 1.5% and your top rate for your uh, earners that are over $60,000 is 3.25%. And that will count. So the first, so the, so the first part, the, the very the first 30% will be will cost the uh, uh, state revenues about $800 million, and then every 10% after that's about another $142 million. Now we've done all of the uh, we've, we've done all of the projections for this um, with running different scenarios with the economy. Uh, and, and we feel very confident that we can pay for this, that, there, that we're not going to have any issues with this. We have not this – is, this is figured in in a stagnant growth. There's, there's no dynamic scoring in this. This is a very uh, – uh, figured in with a very sterile uh, economy, growth in our economy, which we do not believe that will be the fact. We believe that if we start to move forward in cutting these personal income tax, that we're going to continue to see the state's economy grow. We're going to see people move into the state. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, dynamic growth happened in Florida and, and Tennessee and, and uh, Texas and some of the other states that have, that have moved forward with this. So it would be really nice to see West Virginia be proactive at this instead of reactive. You know, sometimes we're behind the curve uh, on things that are happening nationally, and it would be nice to see that West Virginia could be out on the forefront. I think this is a once-in-a-lifetime um, uh, transitional period for West Virginia with the global energy prices is what they are. Uh, with us being able to hold the flatline budget, you know, we've built about $600 million into our budget uh, savings the last four years by holding a flatline budget. Um, you know, we, we figure about 150 to $170 million per year uh, in, in natural growth of the budget, which we've been able to hold the line on. So we're looking at anywhere between 600 to $700 million um, and just by holding the, the line on the budget. Kevin Knowles, go ahead. John, you, you, you talk about uh, $1.8 billion excess over the next three years. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's our projections. Working with um, the, our, our revenue department, working with Dave Hardy and, Dave, uh, and, and Mark Muko, um, who is our chief economist for the state and is the, uh, is the, director, um, the deputy director for revenues. I, I believe I have his title right. I'm not sure. There's so many titles. It's hard to keep them all straight. So, so that's that seven million dollars safety net. Is that seven seven hundred million dollars safety net? Is that a one-time uh, deposit into that safety net, or is that over three years? Uh, no, that's a one. That's a one-time deposit. So, that, in other words, that's a one-time deposit that we would have on deposit if we needed it. Now, if we saw where things were starting to get um, a little sideways, and that's that's the beauty about this bill. This bill is. Is what I consider incremental politics. We're moving. We're kind of getting a pretty good bite of the apple up front. Um, that gives us the first year to deal with it, and then you know we'll come back. To, and, and this will be in place for the second and third year. There's nothing saying that this legislature or future legislatures cannot slow this down or be able to add to this. Um, so that's why I like it because it, it moves incrementally. It's fiscally responsible. Um, it, it's at a uh, controlled rate that we will be able to stay on top of. And this legislature, um, you know, it meets. Uh, just about every month, we're always taking a look at the numbers, and if we had to um, pump the brakes on this, we we would have the ability to do that. But I, I don't foresee that happening. Well, yeah, it makes it makes sense you, if you're talking incrementally, and and that you uh, you know that that's going to cost uh, eight hundred million. That if you're putting seven hundred million aside, that you'd be able to take a look at that if you see something happening, you can back right off. Yeah, I mean, we know that the first the first. Um, um, 
tranche of it's going to hit revenues for about eight hundred million, and we we know that there'll be seven. We keep forty million dollars in that reserve fund all the time, uh, just for taxpayers' refunds. So we know there'll be seven hundred forty million dollars in that fund, seven hundred million of that set aside for uh, if there happens to be any problems with this. But I, I think it's a good fiscal. Uh, responsible approach to being able to uh, cut taxes for West Virginia taxpayers. The West Virginia taxpayers have been, you know, uh, uh, pulling this card along for all these years, and we've been able to uh, right-size government, have as much transparency in government as possible. And uh, I think it's time that we try to do something to give some money back to the West Virginia state pay, uh, taxpayers. Vice Chair of Finance Delegate John Hardy is our guest here on the program. John, I got a text from CPA Ken Apple who said nothing to fix the marriage penalty on income taxes addressed here. I, I have not heard that yet. Uh, I think I have not heard I heard anyone talk about that. I haven't heard anyone say if there's an amendment for that coming. And I think that, um, you know, this is a means to the end. We, we are probably not going to go back and take a look at those uh, special cuts here and there. Uh, we are going to try to just cut everyone's taxes, and the, uh, the means to the end is to get to zero. So uh, I do feel that uh, it's probably going to take us six to seven years to get there. And, uh, you know, maybe on the tail end of this thing, there may be some tax shifting. Uh, by, by the time we get to year maybe five or six, we may have to take a look at uh, sales tax and may, maybe have to have a you know a small bump in sales tax to be able to cover those last maybe 30 percent or so. But I think we can uh, do the um, the heavy lifting up front with the revenues that the state is generating right now, and and let's let's say that we have a a huge growth in our economy from uh, people moving to the state. Then you know that may that may offset where we think we need to be in year five or six. So it's exciting times. It's very exciting. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this is perceived on the house side. Uh, amendments that come to it uh, that are that are offered for this bill tomorrow. Tomorrow will be second reading. Uh, then hopefully we'll pass the bill on Wednesday. Uh, it will be even more um, exciting, and maybe the, maybe not the word to use, but it will be interesting to see what happens to it uh, when it gets to the Senate. They'll see, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be a part of the nego- I'll be a part of the negotiations behind the scenes, and and uh, we'll we'll just keep, you know, we we've got this done early. We've got a lot of time to work on it, and uh, it will be very interesting to see how this plays out. John, there is a theory circulating that you folks handled this early to call the Senate's bluff and that really and ultimately the Senate still wants to work in some type of personal property tax relief and uh, perhaps go with a smaller state income tax cut initially here. Well, I can tell you, Rob, I'm just very focused in my new position here as the vice chair of House Finance. I'm working very closely with the new uh, finance chairman and also working with a majority leader in my caucus. So I, I can't really, you know, talk about what the Senate may do or might do or, you know, what their reasoning may be. But I'm, I'm working very hard uh, trying to be make pragmatic decisions uh, in the House and working with my leadership and, and my new role and trying to uh, do the absolute best things that we possibly can for uh, working West Virginians. It's time that we have uh, stepped up and we do something for working West Virginians. Uh, you know, our, our middle class taxpayers are always the first ones that are burdened with government policies and government bureaucracy, and they're always the last one to get any type of benefit from it. So uh, I really hope that uh, we can manage to move this legislation forward and be able to start to give some relief uh, to our working West Virginians and our taxpayers. Yeah, John, I uh, I know you're very excited about it, as are many other people, but I'm going to kind of pick up the banner that my colleague on Friday, Larry Schultz, would say. Uh, we have uh, we have a lot of issues that have been raised recently about DHHR, PEIA, uh, the jail costs, the, uh, the underpaid teachers, uh, state employees, and the like. Uh, Will, the, will 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 you be able to address uh, both the House and the Senate, address some of the needs we have in these other areas as well as the uh, 50% tax reduction? I think we will, Bill. I mean, if you think about what we're talking about, excess revenues of $1.8 billion. Um, so, you know, we take this $700 million off for that safety net that still leaves $1.1 billion of excess revenue that we can use uh, to fund some of these problems now. And most of these are one-time expenditures. They're not base building. I think the only thing that the governor really spoke about that was base building was the 5% pay increase for public employees. But, you know, that's going to leave another $1.1 billion in excess revenue. And then also the governor, we had um, 
about $400 million of unappropriated funds that were left over from our 20, uh, 2022 budget. So we've swept those funds now, too. So now that gives us uh, a, a pretty good nest egg to be able to start utilizing that money to put towards PEIA, um, pay raises, and, and some of the areas where we have the inequities. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the pay raise you know, comes into this. And, and I've been pretty vocal about this, and I have no problem saying this on radio, and I've said it to everyone. I'm not interested in voting on another pay raise for public employees unless there's some type of locality pay put in for um, areas that are experiencing extreme growth and uh, the cost of living, or maybe not say the cost of living, but real estate cost and the, the cost of renting a home or owning a home. Uh, is, is way more exorbitant than it is in other areas of the state. So I'm not very interested in voting on a, a pay raise bill unless there is some type of um, uh, locality pay or whatever you want to call it. I don't care what you call it. You know, if you want to call it a deferred housing allowance, if you want to call it BAQ, if you, I don't care what you call it. But if there's not something in our pay raise bill, I don't, I don't have a lot of interest in voting for one of those. Very good. Delegate Eric Halsorter, who's the House Majority Leader, in an interview with us last week, when asked about the acceleration of the John Hardy transfer tax bill, said, hey, he's the vice chair of finance. Now he can push that through if he wants to. That's a paraphrase, of course, but I think that was the general thought. So, so John, what do you know? Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. I like, wow, that so, uh, yeah, so that bill has been reintroduced, um, and it will be, uh, through, will be in House Finance. I can guarantee that it will pass House Finance. Um, I'm pretty sure, yeah. um, and I'm pretty sure that it will pass the House side. Now, what happens to it on the Senate side, I don't know. It, it's, it remains to see, be seen uh, how the relationship between the House and the Senate progresses from here forward. Um, you know, it, it, that, it's really early for me to say that. I, I would hope that maybe uh, I would be able to influence that a little bit uh, as the position of being a vice chair of finance, but you never know. I mean, I'm just another delegate like everyone else, and I will do my best to, to get that through. Uh, House Finance and through the House, and once it goes to the Senate, then we'll start negotiations on that side to try to get that bill um, completed this year. I've also introduced another uh, piece of legislation, just a small piece of legislation that will allow the Berkeley County Council to change its name to the Berkeley County, back to the Berkeley County Commission by just a simple majority vote (laughs) of the the County Council, and then that just needs to be recorded uh, with our local clerk. So that was just a small code and change the uh, change in code that uh, I needed to do. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that bill will be successful. And I also have another bill that I introduced that deals with, um, uh, I got to think about this for just a second. Oh, for the uh, things that the, the county has to print in the, the papers, the uh, legal ads. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, does a, it does a little bit of, with, does a little bit of cost shifting, or a little bit of cost control with that. So uh, uh, with some of our, some of our um, printed, uh, papers having such a low circulation numbers. Uh, I, I still believe that there's a, p- a point for that. I believe that there's a part that they play in that for pr- printing those um, legal notices. But uh, I think that we need to do a little bit of something with what we're being, what the counties are being charged to do. That if they're statute- statutorily bound to do that, then we need to control the pricing of it a bit, or at least set the pricing a little bit. John, Rob's going to cut me off very quickly, so I'm going to get my question in before anything else. You just wasted 10 seconds with <laughs> the preamble. Uh, re- redistribution of, of judges, of the circuit uh, judges. Uh, will that come up again this year? It, well, it's funny. I was just talking to the finance chairman this morning. Yeah, circuit judges, family court judges, and magistrate judges. Uh, I just saw the report this morning uh, for the magistrates, and I, and I had to laugh, and the the Supreme Court, I mean, the, give the Supreme Court all the respect that they need, but I knew the Supreme Court would do exactly what I thought they would do and just grow the size of government. They're not going to go hurt anybody's feelings or, or cause any problems. So uh, the, I'm sure the legislature is going to have to work on that. And I, I, don't, I know just enough about that report to be dangerous right now, but I'm going to uh, start working on reading that in, this week and familiarizing myself with the report for the magistrates. And then we will also be working on the circuits and the family court. But I think we have to the end of the year to do that. But I think they're going to try to maybe add a circuit in the Jefferson County area, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But uh, we're just starting to work on that. John, what, by the way, circling back to the transfer tax to end this, what percentage are the counties expecting back in 2023? They'll be at 30. Up to 30 percent. 30 percent. 20 percent. 2023 will put them at 30 percent. So uh, hopefully my bill will just gather up that last 70 percent and make it 100 percent. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for squeezing us in. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks, Jeff.
Bye-bye. Vice Chair of Finance Delegate John Hardy.